It's okay. All right. So the the one th the thing I want to talk about this afternoon is uh, a number of factors which make projects being interesting or not. You know, you are here. You are probably interested in developing projects. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. And therefore, you're probably interested in uh, comparing the way you think of your project and the way other people think of their projects. And since I've been involved in a number of projects in my life, I can tell you a few things, which of course are maybe obsolete, because you know, as you know, my, my, my face is not just actuality. Yeah? <coughs> so first, when you begin things, um, you need to be, what is it? You talk, about, you talk about your project with someone, a friend, uh, someone you met in a conference like this, you say, well, I'm doing this and that, you say, what's that? What are you doing? What is it? You know. So the, pro the first problem is to explain what you do. And if it's too long, people don't listen. If it's too complicated, they don't listen. If it's too simple, it's not believable, and so on. You know. So the, the first part of the project is to try to make it understandable in a reasonably short presentation or discourse or whatever. Because you will need to do that hundreds of times. You know. You have to repeat constantly what you're doing to other people. And as far as I remember, when I was uh, building the, the CCLAD network in France, most people I, uh, I, I would meet have absolutely no idea about what's the interest in, co in you know, making computers to talk to each other. They don't know what computers are. So what's the idea of com interconnecting computers? You know? So that's the uh, first problem. Explaining. Second thing is, at some point, you're not talking anymore to arbitrary friends or people who are unaware of what you're doing, but you have to talk to other people who have some power. The power, for example, to help you or to uh, kill your project. That means you have to be more precise, more organized, you know, having objectives. Say, wh what are you going to do? What is it? What is it you want to do? What is it you want to prove? Or what is it you want to implement? What's the interest? Who's going to be who going to benefit for that? And nothing is neutral. As soon as you do something, some people may uh, be happy or may be interested, or some people may be actually uh, hostile because they are afraid that what in what you want to do perhaps will undermine what they're doing or perhaps will take some money out of a different budget and so on. So it's part of the game uh, to make sure that you, you're, you're not looking like a, thre a threatening person or, put, or following a, a threatening project. It has to be reasonably peaceful and neutral. <coughs> So objectives, of course, means also uh, timetables, you know, it schedules. When is, when is this going to work? Uh, who is going to check it or test it? Who is going to use it? Because if you do something like a piece of art and you're putting it in a museum, you've done it, but uh, after all, if it's engineering, it may not be the right place to put it. You know. So <coughs> having a practical objectives so that the, you, what you're doing is going to be useful. Next point, of course, is budget. Because if you uh, don't talk about budget, you're not serious. You're going to need money. You're going to spend money. Whose money? Is it going to be your own money? Investors' money? Friends' money? Institutions' money? Something. And that requires that you have a relatively precise idea where where would the money come from. <coughs> so assuming that those different steps have been reasonably well presented and they are successful somehow, of course you can you cannot predict the future anyway. But you can, may, may have some uh, reasonably uh, convincing idea about what could be the future. So if you're, if you're good to convince people about that, they may put some money. 
But of course, money with strings. That means if it doesn't work exactly uh, the way you told them, they may decide that after all, they are going to put less money or maybe just stop putting money. So that's part of the game, too, you know, is to be, at some point, to be defunded. You know? <coughs> now, the next thing is uh, it's not good to be alone on a desert island. If you do something in which there is risk involved, uh, it's a good idea to have other people who are taking part of the risk so that they can support you or at least defend your project because if the project doesn't work properly, since they have been taking part of the risk, they may also be involved in part of the difficulties and therefore, they are more, uh, they are more uh, motivated to, to defend your project. <coughs> we might, if you have a group of people like this, you may call it you know, a, a board of directors or a council or, whatever, or a committee of something, but it's good to have a, a circle of people which are going to be uh, meeting perhaps uh, twice a year or so, not every month. That would be operational. But just in terms of strategy, it's good to have a certain uh, circle of people with whom you can discuss what you're doing. Sometimes they're critical. Sometimes they don't understand. Sometimes they're boring. They also uh, uh, would, like to do, would like to know a lot more details, not necessarily uh, critical. But they're useful because then they know what you're doing and they can talk to other people about the good thing you're doing. You know? I guess it's, like it's, uh, it's probably uh, better not to put just good friends in that, in that board. Because if you put just your good friends, it won't be sufficiently uh, credible. It's good to have some of the people who are, might be somehow not so convinced about what you're doing and, uh, uh, in a way, it would uh, appear that uh, you have, uh, you're looking for all the ideas from other people, even though they may be not quite matching yours. <coughs> so that's, let's say, that's, that's uh, the environment in which you usually start a project. You need to create some uh, sort of uh, ecology or sociology in which you built the environment in which you're going to, do to operate, to work. And this environment has to be sufficiently stable so that it will not disappear or dis disband at the first difficulties. <coughs> so that's the first step. <coughs> and then you start working. Of course, you have a schedule that may last uh, not one year, that's too small a project, but typically two, three, four years. Therefore, you have you have a schedule of things which should happen in the future. And that's, you might call that operation. I mean, you're in the, in the working phase. The initial phase was just uh, setting the plans. So you start operating, and yeah. then you need a team. Again, we don't do things alone. We need help. We need a, a team of people with different, typically different talents. Some people would be interested in programming, some people would be interested in design, or in testing, or in uh, protocols, or they may be interested in uh, uh, <coughs> exerting, trying to uh, inventing new ideas or innovation. So it's good to have a, a sort of a, a Russian, a Russian salad of uh, a variety of people <coughs> in order to uh, not only to have more fun, because you have to have fun too, you know. I think a project in which people have no fun is not a good project. People have to be very happy to work. They have to be very happy to discuss with each other and disagree with each other. If you don't have, if you don't have a serious discussion among people, it's not, it's not alive, it's not, it's not really sufficiently alive. <coughs> so having good discussions, <coughs> is necessary. So that's uh, the however people who have who hate each other that's bad it won't work. 
a team in which some members of the team would hate other people, no good, no way. People have to be happy to, be, to do good work. So that's really uh, an important sociological uh, aspect of a, of a teamwork. And of course, you have to, you have to be uh, sufficiently careful anyway, because some people may fail. That's part of the life. Either they're not interested really, or they perhaps uh, don't have the appropriate level of expertise. That happens that people fail. So I think the critical part should be actually supervised or working at two people together. So that if one fails, the other one knows what, what was going on. So a certain level of redundancy is probably a, a necessary uh, insurance uh, tax in a project. <coughs> and finally, make progress visible. It's very important for everybody. It's important for the team because the team can uh, really make sure that what they are doing is progressed. They like to be able to observe or to, uh, to prove to other people that they have done something. But it's more important also for the outside, for the people external to the project, the sponsors, the friends, the enemies, the, the, the press, the newspapers, the, the blogs, uh, any, anybody you know in the, in the business who might be interested in what you're doing. Uh, that's the kind of people you could invite, let's say once a year. Typically, my, my philosophy was uh, every time when the leaves fall in the fall in the northern hemisphere, then you have to have a, a sort of a seminar one day or two days, in which different members of the project present their achievements, present their progress, what they have invented, how they've succeeded, and so on. It's also very good for, uh, I would say, not competition, but co competitive cooperation, because everyone wants to know, wants to show what they have done. It's also a good way to find out who is doing nothing. <coughs> So that's part, uh, again, of the, let's say, not, not necessarily what you call public relation PR, but it's uh, part of it. it. It has something to do with it, but it's, uh, let's say, more, more technical, more scientific. So that, gives, that puts us in the area of publication. You know, the, you know the motto, publish or perish. That's mostly academia. But if you're building a project, it's not just academia. Of course, you may have academics with you. You may have cooperation with universities, researchers. But it's also the only way to keep track in the future of what been, what's been happening. No publication, no history. So in order to be part of the history, publications are fundamental. And they also force people to write well. It's no longer a draft. It's something that's sufficiently polished so that it will be accepted by reviewers, peer reviews, which uh, is a guarantee that uh, what you're doing is not just gadget. You know. <laughs> so that presentation should be part of that. You know, presentation are a matter of training people, training to present, training to speak, training to uh, make nice uh, slides, whatever. And then, uh, in a way, train to uh, to present things in a short way, but quite convincing, the, just the essential. And that's exactly the same thing, the, the, same, the same mentality when you write papers. Don't put too much stuff in it. Put just the essential. If, they, if there are too many things to put in a paper, in an article, write two articles, two separate articles. Now, part of the Part of the publicity, in a way, is teaching. Well, we, we are not necessarily professional teachers or professional professors. But very often in, uh, in technical schools or universities, they need some specialists. They need some people with particular expertise to teach some course. Not for their whole life, but for uh, perhaps a semester or maybe two or three years 
when the subject is topical and when the uh, professional professors are not yet sufficiently experts in the subject. So that's a good opportunity not only to acquire some teaching experience, but also to communicate what uh, has been, what ideas, what concepts, or what, what methods have been developed in the project and train students who then will be able to repeat uh, that experience later. <coughs> so teaching, uh, I think, is a, an important part of it. Now, just a few words. At the moment, there are uh, some projects in Europe and I've been quite unhappy in the past, in the past years about the way uh, the European Commission was handling European projects in the computing area. I don't mean other areas, which I don't know anything about. But it was much too, uh, much too similar to just sprinkling, you know, putting a little bit money here, a little bit money here, and a little bit money there. Because the laboratories uh, in which they with which they contracted some parts of the project, they needed money, they needed money to, you know, for their, their uh, people who are, uh, are people who are writing a PhD or who are writing a, a thesis or a master, they needed just money for their students. And uh, in a way, it's very useful for um, making the labs or maintain their population of researchers, but on the other hand, it usually does not, not produce anything substantial in the terms of implementation, in terms of uh, running systems, in terms of uh, a completely developed um, uh, object, in a way. <laughs> I think they are perhaps are going to change their mind. I, I, heard, I think, uh, I've I don't know much about fiveware, but I think it's topical at the moment. Everybody talks about that. I've read a few things, but I'm not really, uh, I'm not really aware. Of the, I have not been, I have not been following the way the project uh, has big, has, was at the beginning. Uh, nor do I know exactly the objectives. Well, it looks like an interesting project in the sense that it has to uh, create cooperation between a number of teams. Therefore, you have the idea of teams there, and teams have to cooperate, and they should validate. I think they are part of this, part of the, of the project, which is supposed to have a number of implementation working with each other. That's a good, good idea. Um, now, I don't know more about it, but it looks like it's a more focused project than the ones uh, I was observing in the past, in the past years. Well. I may also mention to you something you, you may or may not know about, is there is an, uh, some, other some other pieces of project in Europe which are based on a system developed uh, by the Boston University called RINA. Who has heard about RINA? Nobody, okay. That means it's not very well known. Well, uh, RINA was developed in the Boston University a number of years ago by John Day, who is also an internet pioneer. It's a completely new conceptual architecture for networking. They, uh, by the way, it, he doesn't call that networking, but internetworking. It's focused on how to put networks together, not on the implementation of this or that network. And that seems to be substantially uh, innovator, innovation, innovators. And there are some teams in Europe which are part of that project. Uh, one is uh, in Barcelona, I2CAT. Another one is in uh, Ireland, Whit, 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 Whitwater or something, Whitwater Strand, south, south of Dublin. And uh, I think there are other teams which I uh, don't have in mind at the moment. I think that's nothing to do with, fi with, uh, with, fi with uh, FiWare. I think FiWare is more in the developing uh, uh, pieces, uh, let's say, common resources, which can be used by everybody. Um, RINA is completely different. It's really a new architecture. So I think the two are not, are not uh, are exclusive of each other. And I suggest some of you who, if you're, if you're not interested in, in fireware, then you may 
take a look at Rina and see if you can some place in there. Well, at this point, I think I've exhausted my 20 minutes. So um, thank you for listening. And I uh, hope you'll have a brilliant and uh, very attract, very, uh, very uh, pleasant and very active, active career. <coughs> In projects, of course, you know. Okay, thank so you. thank you very much. Give him a warm welcome, everyone. And next up will be Mr. Carlos Domingo coming up on the stage. Okay, thank warm you. welcome, everyone, again. All right, so, so I was this morning already here telling you more or less the same thing. How many people of you attended the session this morning? All right, so I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to spare you listening to the same thing uh, to most of you. So I'm just going to do a very brief introduction for anyone else. Uh, and then uh, Luis is going to give you more details about the stuff that we're doing at Campus Party. And then I'm going to have Juan Joyerro, which is the, the chief architect for Fireware, coming up here to stage. And we can give you more like detailed answers about the, the technical stuff. So. What is the future of internet project and what is Fiverr? So basically, three years ago, a uh, bunch of companies in Europe, uh, together with the European Union, we kind of like set up a project uh, called the future of internet to look at what are the next things that are coming on the internet uh, and not look at what's happening today. Okay, so um, I don't know if you ever uh, s uh, read an article from Clayton Christensen. Uh, you know, Clayton Christensen is the guy that brought this book called The Innovator's Dilemma that talks about uh, you need to skate where the puck is going. So basically, if you play hockey, which is not very popular here in, in Europe, I know, but and you probably know what it is anyway, there's something called the puck, which is this thing that people hit. If you go where the puck is, there's no, no way you're gonna get it because that thing you know, moves across the ice very fast. So you need to go where the puck is going. So if someone is here and is hitting the puck there, you need to go there because that's how you're gonna catch it. So this was kind of the same idea. Forget about stuff that is happening today because we've sort of missed already the boat and look at what's going to happen in the next 10, 20 years and see what large companies in Europe can do getting together, together with the European Union, to enable you know, entrepreneurs and developers to basically ride the next wave of the internet. Okay? So what is the next wave of the internet? So the next wave of the internet is going to be a bit about connecting things. It's not about connecting people anymore. We're all connected. All of you have smartphones. All of you have computers. Um, so the, the, what is missing is connecting stuff, connecting the cities, connecting cars. Uh, connecting home appliances, et cetera, et cetera. That's what's called the Internet of Things. And that's kind of like the big wave. And the interesting thing of the Internet of Things is that it's going to allow a lot of traditional industries to be disrupted because a lot of industries that have not been disrupted by ICT will actually be disrupted because you will be able to do the same things you were doing in the past, but in a much more efficient way. So this is not only about consumer apps, but it's also about looking at many different vertical industries and try to build... Um, you know, services for them based on the Internet of Things. So what do you need to do an Internet of Things applications? Was basically you need what, you know, my colleague Juanjo here likes to call kind of like the operating system of the, of the Internet. So today to build an Internet application, there's a number of components that you need to have there. You need a computing platform because you need to run software somewhere. Uh, you need storage because you need to store information. You need stuff to processing large amounts of data because sensors collect a lot of data. You need a way to con connect sensors, very simple. You need some hardware prototyping platforms like Arduino or Raspberry Pi. And there's a bunch of stuff that if you put it together in a open and developer friendly way, will facilitate people building these apps for the future internet platform, for the internet of things. And that's what Fireware is about. Fireware is the component of the future of internet project that builds this platform. There's another part of the project that actually looks at the different industries where we could be doing stuff and try to find use cases of these technologies for those uh, industries as well. So as part of Fiverr, um, we are opening now, as we speak, uh, here at Campus Party, uh, a project called Fi Labs, which is basically to open up a lab where all you guys, which are developers, can actually go and play around with these technologies that have already been developed uh, by other companies. So this, this platform that is Fiverr, we will have uh, instances of the platform running with all the APIs and all the documentation plus help from uh, you know, engineers from my team that will actually teach you how to use it. And in fact, some of the hackathons here are like kind of do the, the Hello World application for Fireware, like you do the Hello World application for C when I study. You probably, I don't know if you didn't do C anymore probably, but you will do it for JavaScript or PHP or Python or whatever you, uh, people use today. So um, that's what we're doing uh, these days here. Now, the incentive for you to participate is, is double fold. There's two reasons why you should be looking at. First is we're giving prize to developers. We're giving 20,000 euros here 
at uh, campus. Uh, Luis has all the details. I will tell you in a minute how you participate and everything. We're going to give more or less in total within the next few months, not just a campus party, but a lot of the events, around 1 million euros in prices for developers that develop for, uh, for Fireworks. So that's a lot of money for you to be made. And then the second thing is in 2014 and in 2015, the European Union is setting up a kind of like a venture fund of 100 million euros. Yes, you've listened well, 100 million euros, so it's a ton of money that will be given to companies that start their business in some uh, vertical industry doing some sort of application of services built on top of Fiverr. So if you get started today, you start learning how the platform works, start understanding what you can do, what you cannot do, you give us feedback as well, and if you have an idea or you want to set up a company around one particular service, there's going to be money for you to do that uh, within, in 2014 and 2015. So this is why you should do it. The other thing you need to keep in mind is this platform is open, so all the uh, technologies are based on open source, like the cloud platform is uh, open stack, etc., etc. All the APIs are completely open, and anyone that sets up a commercial instance in anywhere in Europe, we're going to do the one, but many other companies will do, will have to run with the same API. So you won't be running on any proprietary platform that is also owned by Telefonica or by Orange or by uh, Ericsson or by uh, Nokia. So, so these will all, all be the same, and you have portability. Second thing you need to understand is that we're going to be promoting this for the governments to use it as well. So especially for things like smart cities that are you know, government driven um, in some countries and Spain would be doing that. If your platform, if your applications for a smart city, let's say to monitor, I don't know, park condition and when you need to weather the, the water, the plants is built on top of fiber, the likelihood that it will get adopted by a city hall and you will start making revenue is going to be much higher because it's going to be promoted as kind of like the European uh, standard. So, so that's the other thing that you, you need to understand. And the third one, this platform is European and is, host, is going to be hosted in Europe and it's going to be under European privacy laws. So as Luis Ivan said this morning, this will not be uh, the government spying on your data, but this will be you know, completely protected uh, from you, which I think is something we all need to start thinking about given what has happened uh, recently in the US. So that's kind of my pitch to you about what we're doing and why you should be, uh, get involved. Uh, so I'm going to let uh, Luis Ivan tell you about the specific uh, you know, events that we're running here. And then Juan is going to come on the stage and we'll have like a 15-minute uh, question and answer session with you guys. Thank you very much. Right, so I guess uh, you all have been this morning on the uh, opening speeches of, of Fiverr. So uh, I'm really excited about all the workshops we're going to have during this uh, awesome week of Campus Party. Uh, and I tell you the details of uh, each one, each workshop. Um, well, the first workshop is going to be in just half an hour at 4 p.m. Uh, and as Carlos said, we're going to get started with uh, Fiverr and how to create a, you know, a Hello World simple uh, application. And there will be Raspberry Pis, so um, you just have to go there and attend the workshops, obviously. And then you will be able to go to, uh, I think it's the camp zone, the, the, the tent zone, and, and take your Raspberry Pi. So you can start working with sensors and, and the connect the Raspberry to, our, to your uh, Fiverr application also. Um, but tomorrow at 10 a.m. we're going to have a workshop on how to host the applications on Fiverr. Um, also, you know, connecting them to Raspberry Pi and so on. But how do you know, how do you can you upload the, the application to the Fireware servers and start working with FileLab uh, that will be open? I don't know if right now the FileLab is open, but if it's not open now, it will be open to. Yeah, so just open right now. That's cool. And also tomorrow, there will be another workshop. Uh, the first one was at 10 a.m. So the second one is going to be at 4 p.m. Uh, it will be about 3D, how you can work with, you know, with graphics, with uh, also user interfaces, how you can build user interfaces with Fiber. Um Also, augmented reality, so you can create, you know, very, very cool stuff using, using sensors, using all sort of APIs that uh, Fiber has. Uh, well, what about the prices? Uh, obviously, the Raspberry Pi are very cool, uh, and will be given to the to the ones that have serious projects that want to create serious applications with Fiverr. Uh, they may be test applications or just, uh, you know, applications for this hackathon, but they have to, to make something with, with the Raspberry, not just go to the workshop, take the Raspberry, and, and then run away with it. You have to make something with the Raspberry Pi, something cool using Fiverr, obviously. 
Um, so the so you can access all the uh, hackathon bases on you know legal stuff and so on in Campusero. That is uh, campus dot ro. That is the platform that Campus Party has, uh, like a social network for geeks or something like that. So you have a hackathon zone, and you can uh, enter there and see the the bases. And also there is the Campus Party website. There is uh, I think campusparty dot eu, and you can see uh, all the hackathon stuff. As well, there. Under the prices, um, well, first of all, prices are not incompatible with other hackathons. So you can uh, win this hackathon and win other hackathons, uh, for example, the uh, Social Good Hackathon, or I think uh, it will be a five percent hackathon as well. It will no, uh, yeah, so, uh, well, other hackathons, it's not. Um, what else? Yeah, so the prices. The first one is going to be uh, uh, 5,000 yeah, 5, euros. Second one, uh, 3,000 euros. Third one is going to be um, 1,500 euros. And the fourth one is going to be uh, 500 euros. And there, there are going to be also like uh, special prices. That was the the like absolute prices, the generic prices. There are going to be like special prices to the best cloud application, the best Internet of Things application, uh, the best UI application, and the um, best developer and they're uh, 21 years old. Uh, please note that if you are under 18, you cannot participate. Or, or if you are in a team, for example, uh, you would have to select your the one that is, uh, you know, mm, older than 18 years old because of uh, legal stuff. But yeah. Uh, and so each price will have uh, will have 2,500 euros. Of money, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we're gonna have a lot of challenges for the next year, um, and we will wanna have like uh, eight hundred and sixty thousand euros in prices during the next year. That money is not from for for this hackathon. It's not for this week. Also, it's just uh, challenges for the whole year. And also, as Carlos said, there will be like. Uh, 100 million euros for in the 100 oh, uh, 100 sorry 100 million euros uh, in investment for entrepreneurs in the next years, but that's not in this campus party. And also uh, tomorrow uh, at 3 p.m. Uh, there will be a session in the developer stage. That I think is this one, right? Uh, and we will launch a challenge with uh, 250,000 euros in prices. So be here tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m. It will be something related with smart cities, but I cannot tell you what exactly. But you know, a lot of money and smart cities. So it seems really cool. And that's it. If you have any doubt, just uh, ask me or any, any yeah, for, for example, Juanjo that is here, or Carlos, uh, and you know, go there to the to the bar camp, to the hackathon that will start really soon, like in 15 minutes, I think. No, more, like half an hour. So that's it. All right, thank you. So what we're going to do for the next uh, 15 minutes, so we give you like, time to move to the, to the uh, bar camp area, is just to take some questions. Because uh, this morning there was a lot of questions, and I felt probably that you guys wanted a, a little bit more like uh, technical explanation. So that's why I asked Juan Joyero. Hello, Juanjo. Welcome to Thank stage. <laughs> he's the main uh, architect for the Fireware project, so he's the one that knows a lot about the technology. Unfortunately, I'm, uh, you know, I'm too rusty and too old for all of the things that these guys do. So, so in case uh, you want detailed questions about architecture, APIs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, this could be the the moment to do it. Um, we're gonna do the the training workshops later anyway. So, so depending on what you want to know, we'll just uh, do it at the workshop later. If you want some more questions about how how the project works, how to get involved, etc., etc., and so I can answer that for you guys. So now, stage is open for you guys. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I would like to ask that the proper proper way how to register a team and an idea for a hackathon is through Campus Labs uh, website and accept challenge or or something else to do uh, to register for uh, the the fiber challenge yeah register team for fire challenge 
Yeah, in it? the in the um, campus um, bar camp uh, campus lab uh, website, you will find all the instructions to run this hackathon. Uh, there you will find first of all the terms and conditions you have to comply with. There are a number of uh, rules and instructions to follow, and um, you will uh, there will be a form that you will have to fill up when you submit your application. And uh, the mostly the, the the only two requirements that we are asking for is that you develop an application that relies on fiber technology. Uh, you have to explain which generic enablers, because there are plenty of them, so which generic enablers you are using. The more you use, the more uh, chances you may have to, to win a, uh, the contest. Of course, your application has to be also cool. And um, uh, the second requirement is about um, hosting the, at least some of the components of the applications on the cloud that we are going to provide. Um, FileApp uh, is already up and running. Uh, you can go to um, um, lab.fireware.eu and there will be a self-registration mechanism out there so you can very easily uh, go there and start running the, uh, the platform. Um, of course, we are running these workshops that uh, will help you in, in doing this trip, but uh, but I think there there will be many things that are going to be self-explanatory, so you can try to start with that. And don't forget, if you have any questions, there is a whole team of um, 20, 30 Fiverr developers in close to our stand. So arrive there. If you have any technical question, sure, there will be an expert there uh, willing to help, and we are going to stay the whole week. And I think that's all. So pretty, pretty uh, easy, and don't hesitate to to come to contact us. You guys know where this, the the firewood stand is, right? It's on the arena area in the middle. All right. Someone else? I I don't see. It. Oh, there you go. There was a. Uh, okay. You're next. Sorry, I missed the talk this morning, so you might have already covered this. Um, what's the coolest thing you've seen made using Fireware so far? What's the coolest thing we have seen? We haven't started the hackathons, so I haven't seen anything get developed yet. So <laughs> you must have made something, though. Eh? You must have made something, or someone must yeah, have made yeah, something so, with so, it. Yeah, so I think, as, uh, as Juanjo said, there's a, num a, a number of generic enablers. So there's a bunch of things that you can do. There's some things that are not, let's say, very new, because it's like an open stack based cloud platform. That's not very let's say differential i think that the interesting thing is uh, the stuff that you can do with internet of things and you can you can connect sensors so we for instance using that uh in santander to run trials for smart cities and connecting some sensors in the city and, uh, and i think the combination of the multiple things that you can do with a, sin a single platform is what's differential probably compared to to single platforms i don't know Juan, who you have any other yeah going into a little bit about into detail on, on the different uh, chapters because we address several uh, regarding the very cloud infrastructure i would say we are bringing two differential aspects uh, to openstack one is that we are building OAuth uh, access control uh, built in as part of the technology OAuth is uh, an authorization authentication mechanisms to allow to keep access control to your APIs that is not something that currently OpenStack uh, provides, but we have integrated that into OpenStack and, and allowing this uh, in for any application that you develop on top of the Fargo Cloud. And also we have set up a number of automatic deployment tools that uh, kind of provide uh, more high level and advanced uh, tools to deploy your software on top. Then over that, we provide a number of APIs that deal with uh, exploiting context information. So, so very easily with a standard API, you can gather all the data that may come from the Internet of Things, but may also come from users interacting with your applications or um, users uh, that are other processes. And uh, there is a standard API that is trying to bring uh, um, a standard for the first time that uh, dealing with the management of context information. Big data analysis, we rely on, on the Hadoop technology, but we enhance it with a number of interesting features. 
And um, I believe that uh, also very interesting, uh, but I could elaborate a little bit more and I invite you to attend the workshop, but I would uh, like to end uh, mentioning these technologies we are currently incorporating about support to 3D web or augmented reality technology, which will be make it rather easy to develop applications that uh, try to incorporate those kind of features. I think in terms of services, so not in terms of technologies, I think that the most interesting thing, um, everyone thinks about consumer applications because that's what we use ourselves all day. And I think that um, the, the interesting thing will be to think about vertical industries, uh, like, I don't know, mining, agriculture, things like that, that look like very old fashioned, and very boring, but that's probably where the biggest opportunity in terms of doing new stuff comes from, from the internet of things. It's kind of like smart cities, but smart agriculture, smart uh, mining, smart something, because those are the industries probably that have yet to be you know, modernized by new technologies, uh, especially by ICT technology, They've modernized by all the technologies. But uh, I know it's, uh, it's more complicated for people here to think about it because you don't know the industry, but one of the things we're doing in the project outside the fiber, so outside the platform, is precisely look at these use cases for these vertical industries to try to come up with applications. I think it's also worth mentioning that be beyond the technology, we are bringing as a uh, differential aspect the ecosystem we want to set up around Phyla. And there, it's very interesting how several cities are coming to us and wishes to connect to Phyla and provide the, their data and make it open there to and make it available to developers to create their applications and bring their innovative ideas. There is no initiative like that. You don't have cities connected to Amazon. We do will have cities connected to Fiverr and Filab. Sounds great, thank you very much. Thank you, there was a question behind. Yes, uh, I have a technical question because I came a bit late. I'm interested in what is the state of language integration for these APIs, you know, what should I use? Java, I mean, Python, or just REST and deal with it myself? Well, uh, we are pretty open in that respect um, because... Uh, yeah, but started I mean, like, what's the current state? Like, what works well, the best? But first of all, we do not want to impose any programming language. So in that sense, Fireware is not a platform as a service kind of cloud like uh, others where you will be kind of obliged to use Python or, or Java or any other technology. This uh, is up for you to select what technology you want to use. Uh, you will be able to set up uh, build machines and uh, set up the runtime environment that you may need. And uh, those uh, generic enablers that are complementing and providing kind of libraries that you could use for develop applications will currently be providing REST APIs. So we are currently relying on REST as kind of a standard uh, common lingua for uh, exposing our services. Although uh, it might be worth mentioning that uh, one of the works and activities that we are running uh, within Fireware is creating of a new generation middleware that intends to allow and support uh, very fast and uh, relying um, quality of service aware middleware that uh, would allow uh, interaction between components of your application in a much uh, faster, efficient and and uh, a re uh, reliable way than, than REST APIs. This is an alternative in that sense that we are offering. Okay, did this answer the question? Does it answer the question? Okay, thank you. Okay, more questions? Um, I would have one quick uh, question. Uh, uh, are there are be besides some um, no, examples or something like Hello World apps uh, applications based on Fiverr yet, or it is in this stage that this stack is ready, and but there are not um, publicly known. Um, I don't know applications using this framework? 
Well, there, there are two sides. Uh, we, we have developed a, a number of applications that uh, we intend to use uh, for training and some of them will be used in the, in the workshops that we will run this week. Uh, in parallel to that, uh, there are a number of use case projects that are running within the program, the Future Internet PPP Public-Private Partnership Program, uh, FIRE is part of that are focused on developing uh, applications based on fireware. In the session tomorrow that uh, runs in this developer's uh, stage from, uh, I think it's uh, three to four, uh, we will have an opportunity to show you some applications that and some projects that are trying to develop quite, let's say, complex uh, applications and interesting applications based on fireware technologies. So. Uh, those are applications that, um, well, you would need to discuss with their owners whether those are going to be public or not. Uh, Fireware is open as such, but the applications on top may not need to be. Uh, but uh, yes, there are currently applications being developed using the technology. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so okay. if there's no more questions, we're gonna break here and then at uh, four o'clock is when the, at four o'clock, yes, I haven't changed time, so I don't know what time it is actually, four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> In, In 10 minutes, Spanish we have time. the workshop. In yes. 10 minutes, we start the workshop. Thank you very much for attending. Okay. Okay.